The tribunal, as you know, was established on paper in 94. And actually, it opens its real door in 95. I was one of the very few privileged persons who have served from 94 to 96, from July 94 to October 96 in Rwanda as the head of the UN Human Rights Office in charge of investigating the genocide. And then I moved to Arusha where I was given the task of establishing the witness protection program. This has given me a leverage to understand how the UN as well as the ICTR have come to tackle the issue of the genocide in Rwanda. And from 95 to to date, I would say that ICTR has indicted 93 people. We have completed proceedings relating to 55 first instance judgments involving 75 accused. We have also sent 10 referral cases to national jurisdictions, cases involving accused persons who were either in custody or who are fugitive at large. We also have decided to transfer case files involving three top-level fugitives for prosecution by the Mechanism for International Criminal Tribunal that has started a year ago. And two cases where indictment were withdrawn and three indictees who died prior to or in the course of their trial. This is the statistics that we need to have and keep in mind. ICTR as such has completed the last case at the first instance level in December 2012. And throughout ICTR activities, there has been considerable number of remarkable and groundbreaking achievements that my learned colleagues have exposed to you, but I will quickly go through some of them. Among the breaking achievements are the ability of the ICTR to obtain the cooperation of the international community in effecting arrest, in facilitating and identifying the location of witnesses, moving them across the continent, particularly knowing that those witnesses do not have any status in the country of residence. Those witnesses, some of them were living in hiding, and the challenge was to manage to take them out, bring them out, helping them to travel internationally, come to Arusha, testifying, and return. We have been able to also establish a pioneering advocacy for victim-oriented restitutive justice in ICTR. Today, the concept of giving a role to the victim has been adopted by ICC. This is thanks to the effort of ICTR Although our statute did not provide for such a role, except to make use of the witnesses who are victims in terms of their account of what they went through, ICTR was the first organization to write to the Security Council through the former president, Navi Pillay, requesting a change in the statute to provide such a role. We did not get a successful answer, but what we have done was to advocate during the debates leading to the conclusion of the Rome Treaty to give a sound place and voice 
to the victims. We believe that was a weakness, and we try to find a good remedy. And what we have done in our humble manner in the ICTR is to establish a program that cater for the victims who happen to be witnesses by providing them with psychological medical support. We have rehabilitated some of them and we establish a program that is sponsored by member state that provide adequately for all the victims who happen to be witnesses. That was a contribution in a humble manner from the ICTR. We have also, beside this, establish a groundbreaking mechanism to ensure protection of witnesses, which became a level that we exported by getting member states to agree to have the, <coughs> to share the experience of ICTR in that particular area. And we have helped numerous member states in the drafting of the Witness Protection Act in the training of the people including in Rwanda. The achievement of ICTI reside also in the development of the substantive international criminal law and procedures over the last 19 years of judicial activities, which has produced a very strong body of jurisprudence, including the various achievements that have been highlighted earlier. It is also important for us to understand that one of the most critical contributions of ICTR was its ability to arrest very senior level officials who were part of the transitional government that presided over the genocide. Among the people who were arrested, were 16 ministers of a government that comprised 19 ministers, including the prime minister. The ICTR has achieved a great deal in the quality of the senior officials that were, that were brought to count and have them to answer the charges before the tribunal. It's unique the ability of the tribunal to identify <coughs> leaders in the business community, in the clergy, in the militia community, in the youth, in the government layers, and indict them and bring them to court. This has contributed greatly to facilitate the post-war reconstruction of Rwanda. Because for those who remember, after 94, Rwanda was facing a tremendous challenge from those who were still at large living in the refugee camps who were disturbing the development and the peace of the country at that time. ICTR's effort in apprehending those key suspects have made it possible for Rwanda to focus on its development, on its reconstruction, on the national reconciliation process. In a way, ICTR has contributed through the arrest of some high-level criminals to paving the way for the national reconciliation process. This has provided also a forum for witnesses, for victims to come forward and feel a beginning of a healing process. As former head of witness protection, I was a witness to the feelings of the first witnesses in January 97, when the first case opened, when an 85 years old in a Kaesu case, an old mama who lost everybody, who was presented as a witness, who came to see for herself a Kaizu in a box. She could not believe that a Kaizu one day will be brought to a court and answer the charges. She told me this is the best day of her life and she was prepared to die just after having seen a Kaizu. 
And this is a process that help victims to see those senior level people being brought to court and the visual impact of this has contributed tremendously to the healing process. Those are some of the achievements of the court. What are now the critical challenges that we face? Of course, they are the tracking of the remaining fugitives that we believe we need to get hold of. Some of them are still at large. And we identified three critical fugitives that we said the mechanism will take over if we get them. Those are the people that the prosecutor believes strongly that they need to be trialed by international court. You have learned about Kabuga, about Mpirania, about Bizimana. Those are three key figures that we need to have them brought to court in Arusha. We have transfer cases, case file of six other fugitives to Rwanda. We have handed over two accused persons who were in custody to Rwanda because we were of the view that Rwanda judiciary has reached a height where we believe strongly that it is capable of rendering good justice with a high level of standard. One of the critical issues for us is to relocate the acquitted people, which is one of the most difficult humanitarian crises that we're facing. Because ICTR, out of the 75 people for whom we completed cases, we have 12 people who were acquitted. Among them, only five were able to find, to find a place to live. The remaining seven are still at Arusha. And among the seven, one is being released since 2004. And those people are becoming a burden for all of us because we have to put together a system that take charge of everything that relates to them. And no country is willing to accept to relocate them in their territories. This become a critical challenge. And the tribunal has taken it to the Security Council and obtained two specific resolutions calling and encouraging member states to offer their territories to receive those people. Unfortunately, nothing happened. Some of them are married, have children who are citizens of countries like France, Belgium. But unfortunately, for reasons linked to the possibility of having to becoming a threat to peace, to security situation in those territories, the said member state have refused to receive them and allow them to get reunited with their own family members. This is becoming a serious issue and we have moved to a step further to liaise with member states in Africa, including South Africa, to see whether or not African countries can come forward and receive them. We believe that this is critical to sending a signal that if you happen to be acquitted by international criminal justice, you should not live with the stigma of a person who is rejected by the whole international community by the mere fact that you have one day been indicted. We have received assurances from Rwanda to accept them, but Rwanda is not in a position for the time being to provide them with what they want. They wanted to have documentation to allow them to live freely in any other countries. Because at the time of their acquittal, the reaction from Rwanda was not favorable. So they are scared. That is one of the critical challenge that I want to outline. Beside the fact that we have also other challenge which relates to preserving and safeguarding the legacy of the tribunal 
for future generation so that at least what we have said before never again becomes a reality. We have, we have gone further in bridging the gap between ICTR and the people of Rwanda by putting together a very forceful and comprehensive outreach program which bridge the gap of information between ICTR and the grassroots level people in Rwanda. We have helped to enhance the capacity of the judiciary. We establish programs that enable the layers of the Rwandan society to feel comfortable with the work of the ICTR. We have established since 1999 offices in Rwanda in charge of the witness protection for some people who did not understand what ICTR has done to complement what was seen at the beginning as one of the weaknesses of the tribunal, it is important for them to understand that although ICTR operates in Arusha, through its outreach program, we were able to bring ICTR to the grassroots level in Rwanda. Thank you very much.